Oh yeah, yeah, it's sweet. All right, hello, hello everybody. Welcome to the February design stream. This is a funny one because we just had one like a few weeks ago. Yeah, because it was late. Yeah, 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 we delayed it. Um, I hope, can everyone hear us all right? Um, I had to redo the way the microphone is set up, so I don't know. I'm paying attention. I'm just tweeting right now. Yeah, well, that's you gotta, okay. you got to start every episode with some tweeting. Yeah, I would write... So I'm going to finish talking about Arkham. Uh, it might be worth r waiting till Fantasy Flight tells you it's okay to buy Dunwich to buy Dunwich because they'll make it a lot better. Um, we have really... Uh, I am about halfway through Edge of the Earth. I've been playing it with Drew. And it's pretty good. It... Um, I think it's actually very good. It's just, it, it's not an easy, um, it's just not an easy recommendation for like where you go after the core set because it has, there's just a lot happening in it. And I think Dunwich, then Carcosa, and then wherever you want to go from there. I can't hear anything. Oh, well. But people are saying they can't hear things, so I don't know if that guy's joking or not. Well, yeah, they're, they're having the conversation we're having, so. All right. Uh, the loud ba backward background noise is because we're next to a highway, and sometimes there'll be loud background noise. No, we're not uh, not a highway. A, uh, it's a four-lane road through the city. Yeah, with a train in the middle of it. With a train in the middle <laughs> of it, yeah. Uh, all it's right. easy to get to. It makes it very easy. We have a, And I get to watch trains all day. I have trains, like, right outside my office window. It's a dream. Um, sometimes you see a felony arrest. Yeah, sometimes you see a felony arrest. Uh, so, we're, this is our February chat. I'm trying to think if there's anything interesting happening in the studio. There's lots of interesting happening in the studio right now, but in terms of future projects and things we can talk about, not a lot. We're all busy right now. Mm -hmm. Um... Some of the big questions that we are like thinking about as a studio have to do with, you know, when and if we do Kickstarters the way we're going to do those this year. That's a topic that we've been uh, sorting through a lot. Uh, we're talking about conventions, which ones we might go to in the near and long term, what it's going to mean to go to those conventions, things like that. So there are lots of prep for the coming year. Uh, anything? I won't slam the mugs into the to ask anymore. That's what they're saying. Oh. The mugs are amplified. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Anything what? I'm just trying to think if there's anything in particular about what's going on in the studio. We're in an interesting period. I mentioned this last time um, where the staff that did Ahoy um, are entering kind of like a short creative cool down or actually they're kind of in the middle of a creative cool down. So, you know, like Kyle's been able to have space to do hopefully some experiments and to kind of just sort of like stretch a little bit. Nick is working on um, some new projects, and he's not sure. You know, he's got half a dozen projects he's thinking through right now, and mm -hmm. he doesn't, you know, it could be the next, his, his next project might not be any of those. It might be something totally different. Um, and I'd so, be happy to pitch games to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're working on that. You're working on ARCs. I'm, I'm working on ARCs. Dark, Dungeon Fortress, whatever, whatever we're going to call it. Um, making, I, God, you know, it's like, I've designed games before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm hitting the point where, A, I'm starting to enjoy the design, which is, you know, it's like you'd like it at first, then you hate it for a while, then you get back to liking it, so I'm, I'm there. And, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I always, people say, how do you know when a game's done? And I'm like, well, I, I play it twice back-to-back, -back, or I voluntarily t play it twice back-to-back, -back, which is what happened mm -hmm. Saturday. I don't think we're done by any, by any stretch, but yeah. But we're now we're hitting the point where like I can feel this leveling up of designing paying off because I'm like, I think five years ago I'd have been like, yeah, right, I'm like, ready, ready, ready yeah. to kickstart, yep. yeah, I'm ready to go. Uh, and now I'm like, no, 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 I can make this a real game if I do, the, you know, like the things we talked about this morning. Mm -hmm. If I do those things, then I can go, then I can take the next level. So I'm pretty excited. I feel like I am much more inclined to not rush any part of the project process now mm -hmm. in a project like some parts if they're unfinished I like note that they are unfinished and go work on another part as mm -hmm. opposed to feeling like this is good enough I'm just gonna you know call it done for the day um, when do we start sprinting though that's the that's the, the real thing because you, you want to make sure that like you know there is there is this phase sometimes we call it like the design development handoff but it really is not it's not quite that clean and simple but there is a real step where, you know, the question is, this bridge that you've been building, is it going to be able to, like, you can walk across it, but could you run a truck across it? Could you 
have a truck every five minutes going across it, and mm-hmm. that, like, you know, if it's really load bearing, that's when you can start moving moving that in. This is a stream that's gonna be filled with weird, bad metaphors. Uh, I'm excited about driving a truck across our games. Yeah, always. <laughs> um, uh, Ahoy, box art will be dropped when we want to drop it. It's all done. It's yeah. done. Um, is Kyle watching? It's really gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. Yeah. It is, in the opinion of some people on staff, the best of Kyle's covers. Mm. I think, you know, it's and it's steep competition. Um, no, we're uh, Patty made a two scale. Um, box that where mm-hmm. she like printed off the art in the back just so we could see how it would like look on a shelf and it's, it's just sitting on one of the tables out in, in the common room and it just makes me so happy whenever I walk by it because it's such an exciting box. It's amazing. But, yeah, but we yeah. Um, can't can't chat about that uh, for it's going to be a few months till we really start talking about Ahoy and all those things. Um no updates for the estimate root shipment. We're figuring out some stuff right now. Uh, as soon as we have good estimates, we'll give you good estimates. Oh, what I will say is the estimates I've been seeing mm-hmm. are people are like really pessimistic. <laughs> like, right. like someone is like, well, I still have to ship it, so it's at least X number of weeks away. And I'm like, it's been on boats for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But also, like, well, and this is actually this is a fun behind the curtain moment. Um, once you get past like five thousand or ten thousand copies of a of a thing, mm-hmm. uh, you're not really. It's not like the entire shipment is on one boat. Yeah, it's on like a lot of boats. I mean, the way the containers get bought and sold is. I mean, there's a market for them, and it might be that the containers that you purchase passage on could be over a dozen boats, mm-hmm. and could take you know weeks and months to sort of fully get to the factory. Now, we schedule things so that we can start shipping as soon as we start. Getting soon get, enough, yeah, as soon as yeah. we get containers in, but it, um, you know, there are there there are boats on the ocean and in in the full there are boats in lots of different places because it's a big it's a big shipment with lots of containers and this is something that when you think about big projects like uh, Frost Haven, like they're looking I mean that that's a product that will be fulfilling for six months probably yeah because I don't have any containers as well you're not being poetic enough because what we're not we're just not big enough to buy. Some companies get all 10 on the same ship, but we're, yes. we don't have that sort of cloud. So. Well, and it's one of those things that, like, you know, we could maybe spend the extra money to do that, but then what What do we do? We only have one or two docks yeah. at, at our warehouse. <laughs> um, so, like, all the containers are now, you know, it's like where you, where you want to put your bottleneck. What we're trying to say is it's a logistics game. Um, it's, it's a pick, it's a pick up the game. So the uh, Ahoy box will be uh, roughly the size of the Riverfolk box? Yep, it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty much the same size as Root Riverfolk. Uh, it's definitely the same footprint. It's just the height mm-hmm. is, the, is the only thing that's really, really off. So if anybody's curious. All Oracle Pig expansion, I'm into that. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we're, that we're working on. I don't know, it's kind of a, I mean, like we have the, the, the two of the products that Patrick and I are working on right now, which we'll talk about more later are just underway but they're both huge projects and then the rest of the creative staff is either in like a cool down or holding pattern or kind of working on other things there's a lot of stuff that happens after a game gets complete Mm -hmm. so for instance like marauder has been done in terms of the file prep for many weeks now many months really Mm -hmm. and one of the things that our graphic design team well patty mostly will be doing soon is starting to get those files ready for the language partners um, and that that takes time, and they're you know they're you know and, and we have to figure out like she gonna do that job before she starts working on some arcs graphic design or after we're not we're not sure yet but you know maintaining the lines takes a lot of um, just a lot of like hands mm-hmm. um, I saw a really interesting post I'm sure some of you have seen it uh, Jamie Stegmeyer posted his like five year look back did you see this no from, I, didn't from, I think from last week maybe uh, but it was interesting and um, he directed his attention towards his staff. Which I thought was fascinating. So Jamie has a staff of three full-time people and like two or three part-time, I think. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he has 125 contractors. I don't even know 125 people. Yeah, it's just a huge. It's a huge number. And this is a very like I, I thought this was interesting because this is a place where. How Leader Games is organized is just so fundamentally different. Uh-huh. Because, and I'm going to just sort of guess here, 
you know, if Jamie had to prepare, for instance, a language edition for Wingspan, yeah, he'd find the right contractor, assign yeah. it, that they would exercise it. But you know, we have a person on staff who's going to be doing that, right? And so it, it, it gives it gives the the, the, the company's very different character. Where I, and I think Jamie certainly out out publishes us, but we're in similar more similar weight classes than different. And uh, you know, we have a staff. There's a staff of what fourteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, full-time folks and J- Jamie is like a big constellation of contractors and so I, I always think about like it might even be the case that the same amount of labor is being done in either place sure um, and it's just interesting how, how differently uh, a studio can be formed I mean I know like fan- uh, Fantasy Flight or as for they when they do art for like say Netrunner mm-hmm. that's like 20 illustrators yeah that work over the, and they just have such a strong style guide that you know, like early on with Netrunner, like there were a couple of cards I was like, those those are stand out a little bit, but you know, towards the end it was all it was pretty homogenous. So, all right, Patrick, what have you been playing? I've been playing. <laughs> so I've been playing this game where uh, I have to run a company and design a board game at the same time. Yeah, it's not awesome <laughs> so I, with the exception of like my children, I have cannibalized. A lot of my free time the last few weeks, which mm-hmm. might be explained why I come in a little weird some days. Um, you know, because I don't, I don't paint now, so that's not. I don't have that time to relax. Um, I still watch TV at night with my wife, but then like after that, I go back to work. Uh, so that's kind of cut down on my time. So what I have been doing is playing games where I that I've beaten before that I can flow really well. So I've been playing Kingdom Rush, all the Kingdom Rushes again. Um, mm-hmm. Which I I bought like during some winter sale on Steam in a pack, and I got all those together. But but I'd already beaten all the mobile ones, so it's kind of silly to buy them. I'm glad I have them now. I've been playing the Walking Simulator Lake, uh, and I have been playing Disco Elysium, which is too stressful for me right now. There's too many hard decisions, mm. um, and so like like I started playing it, and I was like. I can get through this. I'll keep playing it. I play a little bit every now and then, but it's it's I can't sit for a prolonged session because I go back to the zone. Um, been playing War Cry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just picked up its little brother, uh, Bladeborn, which I will play with you someday soon. I'm glad I didn't try to guess the names. I was going to say Battleborn. I would have. Ooh, yeah, yeah, that would have been yeah. Bladeborn, and then um, a little, little embarrassing and. Uh, and then Final Girl, I suppose I played a few games of, and uh, nothing, nothing too inspiring. What have you been playing? I have been playing. Um, my digital gaming has been Apex, Dota, mm-hmm. the kind of usual. Nothing interesting is happening there. Although uh, we, I had a good winning streak a week ago. That was yeah. a, a rare thing in Apex to, to win so many in a row. Uh, and then. I uh, I'm actually I'm very excited. Case of Cud is the next patch is redoing the early areas. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of the advancements in the game's procedural generation and like it's flushing out have they've been working on content for the late game. And so I haven't seen a lot of it because I just rarely get that far <laughs> in, you in, in the yeah. design. Uh, so but I have been enjoying the the new UI and the, some of the quality of life improvements. But the, the next patch is going to be redoing the first two like zones mm-hmm. so i'm very excited for that and kind of like holding off and jumping back into cud when that comes out um and then that yeah that's kind of been it for my oh i've been playing we talked about this at lunch i've been uh playing i've been kind of like doing some jrpgs lately because working on arcs is it's a very narrative like structured narrative driven game and so i wanted to kind of just like tap into a time in my life when I played a lot of those types of games, uh, which was like during high school for me. I played a ton of JRPGs in high school, and uh, so I, I played uh, Dragon Quest Eleven, which is awesome, wonderful. It, it's wonderful, but you also have to know what you're getting into because it's kind of like a kid's fairy tale. And once you get on its wavelength, I think it's fabulous. But it is also a game I could see, like I could even see myself looking at someone playing that game, and being like, "It looks like you're playing a garbage game." Right, yeah. um, but when you dial into it, it's great. Same um, advanced spreadsheets are. <laughs> yeah, where, where, where are the numbers? Uh, but then I've also been playing Romancing Saga Three, which I have really been enjoying. <coughs> I love it. Uh, that game. If I would have discovered that game in high school, I would have flipped out. Um, and I was telling Patrick the Romancing the Saga games are this like 
interesting, like, bizarro world Final Fantasy, mm-hmm. um, where some of the team that worked on Final Fantasy had a fundamental disagreement about the kind of game that they wanted to make, and I'm, I'm not sure who the particular people are uh, that, that had this disagreement, but I knew there was a break in the team, and they, they started making these saga games, which in the U.S., if you play Final Fantasy Legends 1, 2, or 3, which I did play growing up, I loved those games, uh, I didn't realize they were the beginning of these saga games. And then... Uh, in the Super Nintendo, they became the Romancing Saga games, and then for PlayStation, they became the Saga Frontier games. But, it's a long wind-up, the cool thing about the Saga games is that they are like a Final Fantasy, but they're open world. And by open world, they don't mean open world like Skyrim, they mean open world like Ultima. In the sense that uh, at the start of the game, you can kind of do whatever you want. And you can proceed in the plot in lots of different directions. In fact, a lot of the Romancing Saga games present you with a menu where it says, like, here are eight starting characters. Pick one. And every starting character, like, they're all involved in the same plot, but then when you play through the game, you're getting the plot from that character's perspective. And so they really reward, like, replayability, and they have a very interesting combat system that, though it's turn-based, to me is a very clear reaction to, like, a Final Fantasy-style turn-based combat. Um, If you've played the recent game Octopath Traveler, that game is, like, a send-up or not a send-up, maybe like a loving tribute to the Romancing Saga games. So I've been playing the Romancing Saga games and thinking a lot about narrative and games uh, and having a good time. In terms of board games, I've been playing um, Quacks of Quedlinburg with my wife a lot. Uh, I bought those little plastic boxes, and I didn't realize I was going to be the kind of player who has now spent much more money on like things for a game than on the game itself, but that's now me, I guess. It's just, we play a lot of Quacks. I think Quacks is my favorite of the engine builder deck builders. I know it's a bag pull, mm-hmm. but like I would rather play Quacks than Dominion mm-hmm. because it just gets me closer to the interesting risks. Mm-hmm. I think that the engines you build in Quacks are less intricate than the engines you build in Dominion, but I, I think that the expressive range of the risks is higher. And so I, I kind of just want the dopamine. Um, so we're, you know, we're... Um, I do like Banner Saga. Banner Saga is great. I've played that. Um, I'm also I'm very excited about Triangle Strategy, which is coming out next month. The same team that did Aquapath Strategy, uh, Traveler uh, is releasing a second JRPG, which is uh, very much like a Final Fantasy Tactics type game and has an equally bad name. Uh, it's called Triangle Strategy. Oh, that's I terrible. bet it's about strategy, and there's a triangle that's involved in the in the meta design of the of the game's engines. Um, that's fair. Apparently, it has a really cool mechanism where when you come to big plot points, your party votes on what they want to do, and so depending on how you build your party, they're going to want to swing you one way or another. And oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it seems like a fun fun thing. Um, it, it's funny because in, in both instances, someone just mentioned this in chat, those were the working titles of the game. Like, Triangle Strategy was like our upcoming secret project, project sure. Triangle Strategy. And then when the game comes out, they're like, well, we just kept the title. We're just, so it's the day called Star Wars Blue Harvest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sure. um, my favorite Quacks ingredient, I really like uh, the, the little the mandrakes. The mandrakes are my favorite. Um, especially the weirder ones, not the ones that are just like... Uh, Life vests, but the ones that uh, like like the one that gives you the the false pull in the first expansion. False pull. You can like after you draw it, you then draw another one and boost it up by that number, so you can build really explosive cauldrons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I started learning Merchants of the Dark Road, mm-hmm. which I don't know what I think about, but I but the production is so out of its brain, I'm I'm curious about it. And then. Um, the, la- the other thing is I'm playing a lot of John Company right now. They just got the PPC, and I've got, like, three games scheduled this weekend, so I'm going to be doing a lot, of, a lot of John Company play. Wow, you know that many people. Yeah, who, who all have their Vax and Booster. Oh, that's great. Um, favorite deduction game, Patrick, go. Favorite what? Deduction game. Oh, deduction. Oh, sorry, I am... Sorry, right. pa- Patrick's in sinus headache. I have a little bit of sinus headache, so call surprise. I'm going to go with... I know this. I know what I like. I mean, is hidden roll deduction? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so then I'm gonna go with two rooms and a boom. Two rooms and a boom from Patrick. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite deduction game is probably Conspiracy. Mm, that's a pretty good one. With a second, I've talked about this game on the screen, but I'm gonna do it again because it's like one of those games that came out and nobody pays attention to. This game, Divinaire. Divinaire. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great game. 
uh, about being fake fortune tellers trying to call out who the fake fortune teller is. Everyone's yeah. a fake fortune teller, but you're trying to catch each other. Not so amazing. Before you, you get caught yourself. Uh, great deduction game. Very interesting. Um, I like I like deduction games that don't have like Matrix style deduction like Clue, um, which is why I love conspiracy. I think conspiracy is fabulous. Yeah, I really need to work play mind management. I, I picked it up. Oh yeah, Cryptid's really good too. Cryptid is good. Could, I, so Cryptid is. I think it. You know, I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna propose any like. I'm not gonna review someone else's game. But sometimes Cryptid. Can be a little bit too easy once you played it. Like, if sure. you have that one really logical person in the group. But I do like how approachable the problem is. So oh, totally. I and, like yeah, I think Crypt is great. And I think mind management's awesome. I that mind management's. Great. It's so. How am I going to learn mind management? Who's going to teach me? I think Nick and I both know how to play. So okay, like, well, we'll, we'll just start an office. You have a copy, right? Uh, yeah, I you should bring copy. it in. We yeah. should just have an office copy because I think what happened was I started playing it and I was like, well, this is kind of like my home copy, and I didn't oh. want to bring it in. And have the office advance it. Um, Brandy's read the whole series, and so I think she wants to learn how to play. It. I uh, it is it is so interesting to me because it's a. I actually I, I really want to read the graphic novel series. I'm very curious about it. She really likes it. Um, and I, I couldn't. It's so strange to me that a board game is inspiring me to like go read a book. But you know. That's um, okay. So uh, other random. Th oh, here's one more question. Then we'll we'll get into it. Um, I mean, whatever. We, we can take questions all the time. Uh, do you have a personal favorite art that Kyle's done? Individual card or cover? Well, I'm going to give my, like, stamp pen pad answers here. Okay. Because they're emotional. Sure. Uh, so, bear in mind, when I was working on Master Crystal Caverns, I was unemployed. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, uh, and I was... And we were burning up our reserve. We, I, you know, I had some severance from my last job, but like we, were, you know, and I, I am pretty ruthless about making sure I always have two or three months of cash on reserve anyway. And uh, so we, we had, you know, we had about five or six months of cash when I started um, working on Vast, and we, um, I was struggling with like I wanted to spend time with my daughter while I was off, and then I was like I can always work on Vast at night. So, but like one day we went to. Um, the Children's Museum in downtown. And I was a little bit grumpy because I was just like, I'd rather, you know, I just want to get this game done and mm -hmm. like, ready to go. And uh, Kyle sent the first couple pieces of the side quest art um, for Vast Crystal Caverns. And the one of them he sent was Intrepid, which was the knight standing on the cliff looking down on the rest of the cave. You don't see the cave, but that's, mm -hmm. you're presuming that she's looking down into the cave. And that was the moment I was like, this is going to work. Everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm all right. So, um, so that was that was a pretty big moment for me. And then um, the first time I saw the Vast cover, I was like, "Yes, this mm -hmm. is amazing! I did, I we did this, but you know, yeah, like, I, I, I pushed this through." So, uh, so uh, for pure emotion, those two. Mm. I'm trying you? to think. I, I like, ah, oh, man, there's so many pieces I really, really like. I love. I like the balloon and oath that got cut. Yeah, I love the balloon and oath. I love the back of the eerie leaders. Mm -hmm. I love I love the card backs in root so much. Uh, the back of the eerie leaders though was like done. I've mentioned before it was like done on a very hard day. There's just a lot going on. And Kyle, Kyle's reaction to us having a hard day was that he's like, "Well, we're just going to do really good at our jobs, and that's going to make it better." Mm -hmm. And then he he came back with just like four amazing card backs, which are the card backs used in the root core. And I love the eerie leader claw and the vagabond quest back. Love them. I also, I love the Oath cover so much. It's good. Um, because it, like, it was it was done after the game. I mean, the, the game wasn't complete, but it was, like, one of the last things we were waiting on before we got the Kickstarter going. Mm -hmm. And Kyle was being very kind of secretive about it initially. And then, and so, and the whole time I was thinking, like, okay, well, I wonder what is, all the individual Oath cards... They're in the same world, but they're different enough that I, I just couldn't quite see the connective tissue. And then what he did with the cover was like one day he like on the company Slack, like dropped the pencil of it. Mm -hmm. And it was stunning. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of more than I think almost any piece I feel like he's ever done. He showed it to us as he did it. He was like, OK, here's the ink. Yeah. Here's the color blocking. 
here's like a little bit of it fully colored. Here's another part of it fully colored. And then like here he's flushing out the elements. And it was just, it was wonderful watching it get made over like the week or two weeks that he really worked. I mean, he worked on it for probably a, a month, but it really came together in the last week or two. And uh, so whenever I look at it, I feel like I just see all those layers kind of kind of coming together. And I think that's another moment where I think Oath, Vast was risky because it was, the first big thing I did. And mm-hmm. then Root was risky because we were on the Herculean timeline. Yep. And then, but Root, or sorry, Oath was, it's a very different project from from a lot of other yep. games. And so, again, it brought me that moment where I was like, okay, this is, this exists and I'm excited about it. So I think I'm I was, about to tweet that photo. So all right. get ready. You yeah. can share the link. <laughs> Right. Um, I feel like you know o- Oath is interesting because I think all the projects that we've done have felt maybe not the root expansions after Underworld, but mm. most of them feel like risk. No, I think all of them actually feel like they've got risk, even the root yeah. expansions. And to me, that is usually the mark of a good of a good project, right? Like I um, I think well, you know, I, I sometimes talk about the main thing that compels me about a project is a sense of urgency. And that urgency can come from a lot of places. Like sometimes it's the feeling that like if you don't do it, no one's gonna do it. And other times it's it's feeling as if uh, there is some cost to failure or that it's possible to fail mm-hmm. on the project. And that gives it like the success of the project has urgency to it then. And then that kind of animates all the work around the, around the game. And it's been interesting with arcs where uh, one a funny thing that happened with arcs was that the the actual core of the design came alive very very quickly. Uh, and then it was kind of hard to work on the game because it didn't feel urgent. I was like, well, that we could use this engine for any number of things. And then only as we started working on the narrative elements and kind of the metagame structure did that urgency start start firing. Um, was the Lord of the Hundreds name an intentional pun? Yes. Yes. So intentional. Absolutely. I um, To speak to that point, I think it's now like there's like trying to get vast and root together in time made it made sort of artistic like I was like you gotta make just make the right choices but now that I can be deliberate about choices mm-hmm. it's really exciting I'm really I'm really happy to be working on the portraits right now so yeah it, like it's a totally different I feel like we have just a totally different set of tools and we can work on a different scale yeah as possible so the pun is that there is a, a type of Cheese? Yes. Named Lord of the Hundreds. And uh, cheese is name really that good for rats and mice, but I mean, they, well, eat, it. they eat it because it's fat. But, but for cartoon rats and mice, but for it's very good. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> it's good, very, yeah. very good for cartoon rats oh, and mice. I used to have a uh, This right. is what I was... <laughs> no, no follow-up questions. I, just, I didn't know you had a rat. That's, oh, oh. that's an interesting thing to know about. I used to have a pet rat. Uh, when what, I was, what was your pet rat's name? When, uh, Max Up. Okay. And uh, it was from uh, in Minnesota. Every classroom got two rats, and they raised one on milk and one on sugar water, mm-hmm. and then see how healthy they were after okay. a month. It was just uh, I can't imagine doing that today. And uh, and our classroom was obsessed with Max Headroom mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, I love that. It was on TV, and so uh, one rat was Max up because it was. She was, she was a girl, and the uh, other one was Mrs. Henry. <laughs> and I took one home at the end of the end of the experiment, and uh, loved that thing. Did a you lot. take the milk rat or the? I did get the milk rat. Got the milk rat. This is yeah. There's one yeah. thing you'll say about Patrick. He always gets the milk. He rat. always gets the milk rat. <laughs> and actually, it's it's. I mean, it's anecdotal, but like the uh, the life outcomes for Mrs. Henry were not good. Oh. Uh, so um, so that that didn't turn out well. Uh, okay, so someone asked about arcs, and I can give a little bit of a more developed uh, update, dev update. Mm-hmm. Um, so arcs has kind of hit a fun mo- milestone just recently, where there is now enough content for a full vertical slice for the entire. Like you can now actually, it's not even really a vertical slice. So you can play a full campaign, and there are no areas that are like under construction. Come back later. We played one in 20 minutes yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we actually did. So to celebrate, I mean, and, and I'll, I can get into the details of why that took so long to happen. Uh, but to celebrate, I invited Nick and Patrick into 
the, my office the other day and said, okay, we're going to play arcs without playing arcs, and we just played the plot. And so I dealt out like, okay, here are the, the, the two plot choices you're going to make, and then pick one, and then we're going to roll dice to see if it's successful, <laughs> and then we're going to go to the next plot point. And just to try to feel like are all basically I wanted to see I mean I wasn't the main thing that I was trying to do, achieve with that test is to just get a sense of what are the major story beats that are being hit do they feel organic and natural and then are there places where it's telling me to drive off a cliff mm -hmm. where, where there's no design and generally it was all it was all filled out there were a couple of errors that I missed uh, in order to do that the reason I was actually pretty close to having all that stuff ready before Christmas but there was a problem with how the files were built for the game. And so over the past three weeks, I went back and basically since the last time we did a designer chat, I went through and rebuilt all the cards in the game in a new like file system. Um, we're using like some new InDesign features that I've never used before, like a lot of the internal like cross references and sectioning systems and also the creative cloud libraries, which I've never used before. Um, and so we're building a lot of that stuff in and basically I'm starting to get arcs ready for the time when I'm not working on it alone. Mm -hmm. So this is like a really, um, it's kind of a wild part of the game design world. I guess it's the part of any design world. You can work on something by yourself for a really long time, but eventually you're going to need help. <laughs> and you can't just plug a staff into like a pile of garbage. Uh, you can, but the first st step the staff has to do is rebuild Right. That, that pile into something that they can actually work on. And so, oh, and, and because of the nature of this project, um, I really wanted to be very deliberate and careful about how it was rebuilt. So one of the things I've been doing is writing documentation mm -hmm. and saying like, hey, you wanna write content for this game? Here's the style guide. Here are like some things you need to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Here are the different types of cards you can build. Here are examples of those cards. Uh, and and that, that documentation is a little um, loose but over the next month or so, it'll start really firming up. I'll put in examples, things like that. And then um, where this goes eventually is it allows us to build out the game. And then some of these tools we can turn over to anybody out there who wants to build content for fun and you know, kind of do what we did with Oath, where we provided some templates and things like that. Uh, yeah, people through. made their own. Yeah, yeah we, 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 Root's funny because we never actually provided the templates. People just... <laughs> People just did their dang thing um, because they just used the good stuff. Yeah, it was, yeah, you know, it was good. You know, they, yeah. um, uh, they did a fine job. Uh, the um, can I tell a story then? Yeah, sure. My story. So tell I tried story. being a. Our nation wanted to rule fuel production. Yeah, you want to be a fuel in the baron. galaxy. I want to be a fuel baron, and uh, and then we all we all failed and and. So the richest of us took off in a ship. They got they got mad and said, "Peace out, we're out of here." And they took off in a ship. What was I trying to do after that? I was trying to. It, do... it, it, you're, you're trying. You're also. You're trying to get real rich and just live in the best rich person just... utopia as possible. <laughs> in my little my little ship, and then that failed. And and so for PR reasons, I decided to move into philanthropy. And I was trying to build the crossroads of the galaxy where. Where aliens of all types could, could cross, could cross our frontier. Yeah, this is and Warren trade. Buffett's like third act infrastructure pivot. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's actually I'm into trains. I just want to connect everything up. And that's what I was. That's what I was doing. It. And it was very. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, it was. And you know, I mean, dang, I got to, to play trillionaire. So it was. Yeah, that was a good times. And uh, and so I think what I'm hoping is going to happen is either today or tomorrow morning we're going to start um, start getting everything into testing. And then I need to build out some of the plot. And so the other thing I wanted to tell everybody in terms of the, the finish of the game is that basically um, I, I have about half of the content needed for the core box. A little bit more than half mm -hmm. has been designed. Um, and that is more than Oath had at launch. Much more than Oath had at launch. So there's already a lot of work that's been done. But there's still a ton to do. I would love to have this game have something like 80% content ready by sure. the time we launch. I really want, by the time it comes to Kickstarter, I want it to be very, like, close to, mm -hmm. close to being done. Um, yeah, so that, that's ARCS. ARCS is making great progress. I'm really happy with it. It is getting weirder. One of the biggest jobs of the next um, month as I'm building out this, this content is I'm kind of, like, scouting the design space. And so the content is designed in such a way as, like, you know, for example, um, 
what's the right way to say this? So Arx's design is extremely modular. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to plug systems into the design, and that is very different from both either Root or Oath. And so um, the, what I'm trying to do right now is figure out if it's too modular. So for example, in Oath, uh, you can have citizens and the chancellor, and then you can have exiles. There's like those two political alignments. Mm -hmm. In Ar Arx has a similar kind of political al alignments, although they are re reversed. Um, however, the game has space for, if you're in a plot line that opens up like the second empire, it can introduce like a second alignment or a third alignment that comes out. Mm -hmm. And the alignments can interact in different ways. Now, it might be the case. So now I have, I have these, I've built plot lines that engage with the alignment system. But it might be the case that like those plot lines are kind of stupid and it's not interesting to have four alignments or three alignments. Mm -hmm. In which case, we kind of like close down that part of the, part mm, of the sure. design. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out like, is this too much space, too little, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when you hear me talk about templating, that's often what I'm talking about. Like, how easy is it for the game to say a particular thing? We could adopt the race for the galaxy, uh, alien, uplift. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, rebel, and then sell to them. Sweet. Sweet, easy. I know that they want to make more race games, apparently. <laughs> Always. Um, <clears throat> and I, you know, it's, the other question that's going to be answered soon is I'm going to start doing a lot more. I've been doing mostly three-player tests. I just finished my set of four-player four pieces, so we'll be doing more four-player tests. And then I will also probably experiment with fi a fifth player. I, I don't expect it to be successful. I'm probably, I mean, this is probably a three- or four-player game, but, you know, I've, I have never played it with five, so we will see. Um, the problem with a fifth player is you need a lot more content. <laughs> um, what if you just... Had an asymmetric like, they're just there to spoil everything. Yeah, we could. Uh, that would be an, an option for a fifth yeah, player that would yeah, be around. And, and, and the design would, would tolerate that kind of that sort of chicanery. Yeah, you, know? you give a bunch of spoiler cards to one player. Um, yeah, and I would say you know, uh, violence Rayo. Um, so. I'm going with violence Mayo myself, but yeah, violence Mayo. That's, um, that's my idea. So that that comment about strict player counts this is i really think i i have i have a lot of different feelings about this because i think that um i think sometimes it makes sense and i think maybe it's a somewhat fashionable position to say like games should have very strict player counts you should only play brass with two or four or, or whatever yeah yeah um but i actually think that like a scalability as long as you accept the fact that the game is different at different counts the fact that a game can scale well is good. is is just like a. I think it's a. I think it is a worthwhile design goal. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things about how the history games have turned out is I think they are really good at every player count listed on the box, but they're very very different. Like Premier at three is so different from Premier at four or Premier at five. And with Oath, I mean, I really like Oath with three, and I like it with four and five, and I think Oath is also good with six as long as players know what they're getting into. Um, and I think Oath with two works pretty well, and Oath with one works work, works pretty well. They're they're okay. I mean, I think that like you, you can you can grade the game differently, but one of the things that's nice about Oath with one or two is there are situations where you kind of want to be able to play that stopgap game of Oath, and the mm -hmm. game will let you do it. So even if it's not the best experience, you know, it's not going to compare to like Nemo's War or something. It's still a good mode to exist. Uh, however, sometimes when you're working on game projects, they just can only be certain player counts, and arcs has kind of felt that way. Like two player arcs doesn't doesn't work. What's interesting about you, the designs you put forward, is that three player for a long time, like in the aughts, was kind of a holy grail of like, yeah. of like how do we get this to work? And I think Vast and Root solved that, of course, through the asymmetry. It's just yeah, you don't have to worry about beating up one player too much or beating up each other too much. Um, and uh, I think uh, I liked Oath of Three. I thought it was pretty cool. So. It's just fast. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the thing that Oath of, uh, at Three gives is like you can play t twice in a row. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, it, it's funny that you mentioned that. I think about Martin Wallace's Tree Frog games and how one of the pitches was, you know, he did three games a year. Yeah. And he did a standard game. And then he would do a, a two-player war game. Uh -huh. He did Waterloo and Gettysburg. And mm -hmm. then... He did a game that was three player only, mm -hmm. and so God's Playground and After the Flood and I think there might be another one, but I can't remember what it is. 
Uh, but, but the whole the whole idea of those games was like only three players, and it was it had such novelty because right. there there was a real a real perception that there just weren't good three player games. But I think that was the time like right before Agricola. Yeah. Uh, although like Kalos is great with three, so I, I don't know what people were so worried about. Katab is fine with three. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's, it's like it? the the map feels too big. Interesting. Uh, I have played Furnace. I'm sad I didn't play Furnace. It's fine. It's not like I don't want to damn it with fame praise. It's 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 all right. Um, it is uh, my, my brother's review of Furnace was uh, you play the first turn of Sidereal Confluence. Like the entire game of Furnace is the first turn of Sidereal nice. Confluence, which I think is a completely accurate <laughs> description of that game. I love it. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. And then, uh, do you want to talk about Dark? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, Dark is my two to four player. We're still getting a handle on that. We're designing it very specifically so the scoring system works for two player, and then you'll kind of drop in a different scoring system for three and four players, kind of uh, managing it to work. And I, I'm talking like you put in different cards for this, like the this the part of the the references for the scoring is different uh, different cards. And it is, uh, so it's going to be a game about kind of like, I suppose, dungeon masters. Mm -hmm. Not like literal, like players and the people in the real world playing D&D, &D, but like uh, a, a player controlling a, um, a, a villain controlling um, forces inside of a dungeon. And mm -hmm. they're fighting with each other for territory. And I've been working on that since August, maybe? Yeah, so August is probably... Mm -hmm. first game. I've actually been working on it for, like... Forever. Eight okay. years or nine years, yeah. Cause I, I it was, was a game you mentioned to me right when I started. <laughs> so, and it, yeah, and I, I had bombed a bunch of projects this summer, and I went looking at my old catalog, and I was like, I'm gonna, I want to see if I can get this to work. And uh, um, one of the interns and I just belted... Like, we worked three days pretty solid on getting a, a prototype ready and we started playing it and it, it works it worked pretty well so I've been working on that um, and we've you know we had a really fun discussion this morning about scoring right mm -hmm. because what we're trying to do is avoid letting someone limp into in, into the end game with an axis of scoring that's not interesting yeah uh, that's currently not interesting and yeah lots of kids are involved and um, and so we're doing so I, I'm, I'm now shifting the game to be about, uh, uh, whereas before, like, you would get points for doing specific things in the game. Um, like, so every time he bought, brought home five gold pieces, that was worth one point. And if you lost those gold, you lost the point. And now I'm focusing it on if you have the most gold at the end of the turn, mm -hmm. if you have the most territory at the end of the turn, and if you have the most, if you've killed the most pieces by the end of the turn, all three of those can yield one point for you. And um, and then kind of, uh, there'll be kind of a shifting, uh, the fourth scoring vector is called schemes, and if you play a scheme now, you can shift which scoring vector is more important. Mm -hmm. And so then, and the, all that does is open up the possibility for a second point in that scoring vector. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. And let's we'll see how that see how that goes for us. But the rest of the game is, is snapped together very well. I think there's still some unanswered questions about the, um, in the game, you can tunnel into each other's territory, mm -hmm. and um, we have a lot to dis. We have a it's not tunneling isn't firing yet, and and we're almost there. Uh, I played two games this weekend, and there was a lot more tunneling than we've done in the past. It it's an intro like one of the things that happens. So I think sometimes um, this is a place where it might be the case that we slightly misrepresent ourselves when we're talking about design. Mm -hmm. um, where we think sometimes, like, okay, so I'm going to write, for arcs, like Oath, I'm going to write a lot of design diaries. I will not be writing as many as I wrote for mm -hmm. Oath, because that was, like, a short book, and I don't want to do that again. Um, but uh, one of the biggest parts of Oath, that it's, it's in those design diaries a little bit, but kind of as a subtext, is that, like, we have to be thinking about what kind of box does it go into, what does it look like on the table, mm -hmm. what is the, like, product profile the thing that we're building right and i think dungeon fortress dark is in a really interesting spot right now where 
I could see it looking a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. right? And like, you know, so right now there are a lot of cubes on tracks. Like they could be little minis. They mm -hmm. could be little minis floating in little spots, kind of like root clearings. Right. Or not. Or, or and you know, the, the map is, it could be, the map could be done as a point to point map, or it could be done as like a grid that you're tunneling through. Yeah. And I think they're just really, the, those are such strange questions because so much of the design is firming up. But I think that there are still like a couple big like framing questions which mm. are loose still and kind of unresolved. Um, <laughs> and that isn't, isn't a bad thing. It, I mean, it, it's just a, it's just a part of the process. It's his like, his firming is I don't know, I'm fine. I'll, I'll change something if I need to. But yeah, I know. I know yeah, well, I mean, I, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The, the design will obviously change. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think I think this is actually you, your and my design practices are very very different. But mm. both of us. Our great commonality, Patrick, is that we throw away a lot of stuff, and if something's not working, it doesn't matter how clever we thought we were on mo Monday. <laughs> on Wednesday, it's gone. I'm willing to believe I'm stupid on Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. so and, and I think that, that that is that is so funny. I was talking to a, a designer who's who's starting out, and they presented me with a design that is in some respects very early on, but they yeah. had like ossified it. They were like, "No, I got art. It's like all like built sure, yeah, yeah. out," and you know. Their game, from 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 my appear from appearances, seems to work, but it, I know that like I would never want to work on that because I'm gonna want to throw away sure. all this beautiful art right. because I, I just want to really like start from the ground up and rebuild things if they have to be rebuilt. But um, I but the reason why I'm mentioning those questions about darks is like dark I, like I don't know it, how dark is gonna look on right. the, on the table yet. Right. And that's not super important, but it will have to. It will eventually get sorted out. I think in the next couple of weeks it'll be sorted out. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. So I'm working on the scoring vectors, and then I'm, uh, all you know, what I said earlier. I'm hitting that point where I like maybe five years ago I'd have been like, all right, this is cool. Let's fin let's get this in development and finish this. Mm -hmm. And now I'm taking the next step to making it a better game, yeah. which I think is kind of experience. And not only has Kyle not leaked any dark art, I haven't seen any. <laughs> I mean, he showed us the one image of the, because he did kind of propose covers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I've seen that. I've seen that. But that cover was like very quickly put together. It's not a final one. So. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very, I'm very intrigued. Kyle, what you're working on, especially, and like, I'm trying really hard not to put too much uh, arc stuff on his table because I want, I want this to be a space where. He can work on things oh. relating to any project right now. Oh, he can work on my stuff right now. I don't know if I've talked to him. Uh, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, what was I? It was fascinated by a question in there. Yeah, Dark will be a new. Will be my fall game. Yeah, uh, yeah. that I'll be working. On. And then, uh, when do you decide to kill your darlings for a game and, and start from scratch? I think that's an SB Shaman question. So don't take it too seriously. Well, just say Shrek. It depends on how cute the darlings are. Um. When do we just? When is a so okay? Here, here's a funny thing I've noticed. Mm -hmm. uh, in Oath, we uh, I think Josh coined this phrase: the development merry-go-round or the design merry-go-round, mm -hmm. which is that sometimes your intuition is like completely spot on, and then you get persuaded or like something's broken and you change something, and then you go on a big long journey. When you come back, you're like, oh, I actually almost had it on the very first. Pass. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but you you never realize that unless you make the choice. you make the journey. You make the journey because oftentimes, like when you unbuild the game, it reveals like how it was. Like uh, you never have full understanding of the thing that is working. Yeah. Right. Like you know, and, and I think this is why, even though like sometimes you and I, Petter, talk about like reason versus intuition on things. Yeah. And, and I think they're really like more similar than they are different because so often like you intuit how something's working but you can never fully really understand every element of why a game works or vice versa i have figured it out logically but i'm just using intuition to explain it yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. sometimes we use reason to explain intuition or we use intuition to explain, explain reason yeah. yeah so it cycles back i i tend as soon as um i always think about uh i always think about it with like engineering metaphors which is that if a particular system is not like bearing weight, mm -hmm. if I'm spending a lot of rules trying to like shoulder up a system and then it's not really holding anything, that's when like I don't care how clever it is, I want to just cut it. Yeah. Um, so I, if for dark. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the cat. So your base unit 
on the board is uh, you have either a captain or your villain is represented one for one on the mm-hmm. board. And in even a week ago, villains and captains had their own inset card, and you could put cubes on it to represent that those were the troops with that villain, traveling with that villain. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was his army, or her army. And uh, on that card, there was these shields, and on the board, there were some shields. And the shields were like a test before combat that if you had more shields, it was one harder to knock you out of the coming battle. Mm. And that, because I, I, when I originally designed the game, I wanted their like combat to be hit by multiple angles, sure, really well. And like I was like, there are other ways to draw cards to shorten the battles. The combat is card based, and I was like, those are doing those are so much more expressive and so much easier to explain, and no one's tripping over them. Versus. You got five shields. I got four shields. Let's let's go. Yeah. So uh, and, and those were all working together anyway. So I just cut the shields and yeah. I, haven't, I haven't missed them since then. Um, and then, but talking about the the merry-go-round, it's funny you said that because I, I was thinking about this last night. How the original cut of I mean Havoc, you know, like some of the scoring grew out of Havoc, right? And mm-hmm. we had the three columns, the three ways to score score points: gold, control, and uh, Slayer. And they were so, like, they were called out, like, you could only score three points in each one, you're trying to get a total of seven points. And so I was like, abandon that to go to a more general scoring system, and now we're kind of coming back to, now you're comparing. Yeah. Comparing it's, them it's to, like, get, to get your points. It's weird to think about your design as, like, fundamentally an area majority design. Right. But, like, that that is kind of, like, the core shape that it's taking. We're coming back to, yeah. yeah. Um, and I just, I'm like... Yeah, but I couldn't have come back to this with with any confidence if I hadn't done that. Yeah. So I I think about like I always make two complicated combat systems, Mm -hmm. and Arcs had this wild system which I I think I've talked about on stream. I might have even like screen shared it at some point, where the the defender and the attacker would like choose strategies, and then those two strategies would like combine, and then it would show the result Mm -hmm. of what happened in the battle. And the way this was going to work is like the defender had like a wheel that they would spin to their strategy, and then the attacker would choose like their wheel to their strategy, and you would just overlap. Like you would put two like Dune style wheels on top of each other, and then where the holes were cut in the punch would show the icons. What? Did you not see this? I made a whole prototype of it it's somewhere. Um, and it. This guy, huh? <laughs> it was. I thought it was so cute, but it had this fundamental problem, which is you went into battle not really knowing how it was going to go. Right. And so there was this disconnect where you're like, I want to steal from you. And it's like, aha, but I knew that. And therefore, I'm going to hurt you so bad. And it like just, it, 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 it um, I think it's funny. We often talk about rock, paper, scissors systems in combat, but they're never pure rock, paper, scissors systems because if they were that clean, combat would feel so bad. It's mm-hmm. like, you know. Shot, you know, sniper rifle beats shotgun, but like shotgun still can do a tiny bit of damage, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, depending on the game you're, you're playing sure. and everything. Um, How granular it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then, uh, but but there are there are other instances where the darlings never get killed. So in John Company, I made this bananas political mini game. I don't really know how else to describe it. It's a bananas political mini mini game that happens inside the game of John Company, and it had every indication of a darling that needed killed like at birth Mm -hmm. because it was like an extra two pages of rules it is baroque and silly um but it was it it tied so many elements of the game together Mm -hmm. that as i was like trimming it and making it a little cleaner and going through all that stuff what i found was like oh this thing is bearing a lot of load and so even though it's a little goofy it's just holding a lot of weight and like the work it's doing is fundamentally good and that Mm -hmm. kind of protected it um, even though it wasn't, you know, it was maybe more ha- too clever by half. Um, yeah, uh, there were some questions about Void Lich, Dark, Arcs, all the... That. Uh, th- there's a complicated genealogy there that we'll spell out probably in like a half dozen designer mm-hmm. diaries. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of cross homogenation. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short version is Patrick was working on Void Lich, and it had like gotten to a is stall like it kind of stalled. It had gotten to a weird spot, mm-hmm. and 
I wanted to take a design, I wanted to like attempt a design and may, maybe I kind of pitched it like, what if we co-design something and I kind of want to rebuild the engine. Mm -hmm. And then I rebuilt the engine and was like, oh, I actually want to make my own thing. And Patrick was like, okay, well, then, you know, what should I do? And we've been sorting that out over the last year. <laughs> um, that's, I, mean, I think that, that that's accurate. It's not just being overly... Look, like, I have myself. a lot of failed projects I'm going to get back to. It's all good. Right, well, yeah. it was just, it was one of those things that... um I don't know. It, it, it just, I, I think when I started working on it, I saw like a really different like product style of design. Yeah. So even though ARCS was very much a riff on Void Lich, it was like of a different genre. It's like yeah. a totally different project. And there is like a lot, not a lot, but I still, I see Void Lich in Dark. Oh, absolutely. There's like a lot, I, mean, I, th I think that there's a real like. I think it was very sneaky because I was like, I'm just going to redesign Void Lich and in, Here in, you go, Cole. It's like I've seen these cube tracks before. I don't, yeah. but but I mean, I, but I think to be to be generous to you as well. Mm -hmm. uh, both games are like, I mean, Patrick, you play a lot more, many more four X mm -hmm. games than I do, and and I play one obsessively. But and, I and you play one in particular <laughs> obsessively. But I think that um, you know, Void Lich and then Dark are it, they are part of a, a, a continuum of thought. Yeah, that has to do with your relationship to four X's and what you think of the genre. Whereas arcs to me, arcs for me was my weird reaction to Oath. Sure, yeah. Right, so it's like not really arcs is like not really a four X game at all. Yes, it's uh, it is a study of your your, and I. This is the frustrating part about working with Cole. Oh. We're, we're going to get to this, because uh, like Oath is an indictment of victory point. And the victory systems of root, but frankly, the whole whole genre. And then arcs is an indictment of oh, both. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm working on a war game about dudes, and you're like, I've this is the second generation of indictment of victory point systems in games. <laughs> you just get you get so sick of the game after you play it two hundred times. You're like, oh. um, and I, well, I, but I also don't short sell yourself because I do think that like when I talk to you about working on dark. Oftentimes you're talking about like what oh. it means to play Stellaris when you're like a thousand or two thousand hours into Stellaris. Yeah, right. Um, or um, more. Now we all know. <laughs> I've been thinking about how to get the captains. You played Endless Legend, right? Yeah. I want the. Have you? So like when you have a hero in that game, mm -hmm. you make him a, a, a him or her a lead an army. Yep. Yeah. Or they can like be. They can have other jobs. Or they can have a. Yeah. Right. They can have other jobs. That wasn't introduced until later, but the governor was right away. So they could oh, be governor okay. right away, and then eventually they became spies, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how to make the. Oh, that's good. I like that. So when we add espionage, the captain can be slid off in espionage. But I'm trying to figure out how to make it so that if your hero didn't fight in a turn or your captain didn't fight in a turn, then maybe. They can do something domestic. So mm -hmm. this I always think about um, one of the most formative games of my life, which I don't think I've ever talked about with you, is oh. um, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Which I so when I was a kid, we used to garbage pick computers because that was how we got access to computers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we would just, on Wednesday mornings before the garbage trucks come, I would go walk around with, with my friend who lived down the street, and we would just find old computers. And sometimes, they were, these were usually, this would have been like in the late 90s that we did this. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we were finding like 386s and 486s and like, or Tandys. Um, there would have been like no Commodores. But when you took those home, usually they didn't turn on. Sometimes they did. My, my best discovery was we found a, a 386 that had all six episodes of Wolfenstein installed. Oh, awesome. Which I'd only played the first episode because that was the shareware one. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, it unlocked all the Wolfenstein. But there was another one with Romance of the Three Kingdoms 1 or 2. And I was so, I got so obsessed with it. I loved that game. And I loved how you had like a little, like the group of advisors that you would mm -hmm. be assigning to different jobs and they mm -hmm. would like level up and have stats and they could, you'd put them in armies, they would go have, have wars and all that. And I remember one of the games, it's on BG, it's called Heaven's Mandate that I worked on, which um, got kind of done, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I made put it on BG before it was like ready to be done. But it was a game about the Three Kingdoms period in China that was very much like directly inspired by the early Romance of the Three Kingdoms games. Sure. Um, and so I love, like, Civ games that have staffing concerns. Love it. Love it. That's an interesting... Because um, I, I got an early copy of uh, 
By the way, whoever is bounds between Solaris and Endless Space, that's pretty cool. I did say Endless Legend, but... Uh, but I like Endless Space, too. But, um... I say, so, like, I was looking at... Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it. I have a copy of Mall Peak. Which is oh, yeah, yeah, Which is coming up on Kickstarter pretty soon. Uh, which is... Uh, the I think you're supposed to talk about it a little bit. I think it's the sequel to Skull Callow, uh, and, uh, which is a game. It's asymmetric. I like it. Um, but essentially, you know, it's like... Some you could say the genesis of that, and I don't know for sure, but you could say, what if someone played Shadows of the Colossus and was like, how do we play? It? Why do we make this into a board game mm-hmm. experience? And so I'm like, now I'm like paranoid that we're just copying much cleverer designers in video games. No, <laughs> this this is to me one of the like if I were to write a book about board game design, I would think I would want to write. Well, if I would want to write a book about board games, not board game design. I think the thing I would write about is the shadow of video game design. Sure. How like board games in the seventies and eighties inform video games, and then video games go back to informing the board games. Yeah, yeah. And I think I don't think it's a, I, I think the anxiety of influence is good, but it bums me out sometimes that most of the uh, texts that are influencing people are like the most normy video games. And there's nothing I have nothing to show the classes. I think uh, I think Skull Call is cool. Um, but I'm thinking about like how like the the shadow of Sid Meier. Yeah. Where I'm like, if you're gonna make a Civ game. It's a board game. Pick better source material than Sid Meier's Civilization. Absolutely. And Sid Meier's Civilization is cool, but it's just it's it, to me it's like almost funny how much purchase it has. Mm-hmm. Right. It's just, I mean it's amazing how how deep. How well, deep it yeah, goes. because we all spent a billion hours with it as a kid. So, right. And then, yeah. um, so someone wanted me to talk about Titan. I did get Mall Peak. And so you and I are both going to talk about Titan. Yeah, uh, Titan's um, one of my favorite. Uh, I have, yeah, I think Patrick, Patrick and I both love Titan. We talk about uh, Titan a lot. We talk about Titan so much. <laughs> For game we've uh, never played. <laughs> Titan, <laughs> yeah, we've never played together. Uh, Titan, okay, I'll tell a couple of stories about Titan. Titan um, was one of those games that when I was in high school, it was impossible to find. And so I would like look at it on eBay for like $100 and be like, that is an impossible sum of money. And this game looks old and weird. Mm-hmm. It has a funny-looking Viking guy on the cover. I don't. I don't know if I could like My justify. Has horns. Yeah. He's got those horns. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I was always very intrigued by it, mm-hmm. but never bought it in high school. And then mm-hmm. we would play it on the Java app, which was really good. Colossal. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's still around. A great app. It's still around. Uh, that's fa- fa- fascinating. I hope their website is still as fugly as it is. It is. Not only is it fugly, I was looking at the message boards that were on it, mm-hmm. and I realized that one of Clay's. Our Arts, Clay's art sales manager. One of his friends was a regular poster on it, so I was reading his post from like 20 years ago, and I was like, "It's, I, I it's kind of that. warping my mind." I love that. Yeah. Um, so Titan, um, I think there is a case to play uh, Titan in person. I think Titan in person is great. Colossus is fabulous, but when, when you play Titan with people who know the game well, it doesn't take that much longer than Colossus. Um, which is the Java, the name of the Java app. So I was very excited when Valley Games was going to republish Titan. I got it pre-ordered. I got the box of Titan minis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I brought it home. It got in the mail. And the people I, I was living with, like, a bunch of smarties and interesting, ambitious people. And I was, like, probably the nerdiest one in the house. Mm. And so I did not show anybody in my house Titan because I had just gotten them playing board games. We were like, we play Age of Steam. And container mm-hmm. and a choir, which seemed like games for grown-ups. Those are cool. And yeah. uh, but Titan, which has here, I'll show you the cover for people who don't know. Funny Viking man. Well, I got the Valley Games. Oh, that's, oh, that's SP just said funny. Just a very loud noise of sound. So look at this cover. This is like Heroes of Might and Magic Three, the board game cover quality here. And so I was like, I can't show this to my cool friends. Yeah, my cool can. friends with their fixed gear bikes. They, this, this, no. no. Um, so I, I took it up to my bedroom, and I was, um, I was dating the, the, the person who. who oh, the the, the sentence is getting better. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I, 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 I took it out, and she was like, "Oh, that game like looks cool," and I'm like, "This is why I like you." And we sat down, and played it, and had a blast playing it, and we yeah. were playing it so much. That eventually we were like, no one's at home. I'm just gonna like set it up at the dining room table. We're gonna play it downstairs. Sure. And when one of my friends came in, they were like, "What is this game?" And they were so intrigued by it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the choir effect. They they all like they just saw. I mean, especially when you, when you see Titan on the table, you're like, "What is this thing mm-hmm. that you've arrayed on on the on the table?" And so they just gathered around and would watch uh, Katie, my, my partner, and I play Titan. And then eventually they would like learn the rules. We played on Colossus, and we just started. 
it was one of the wildest things because what would happen, there were so many games played in that house. This is a long story now. Mm. That oftentimes you'd never to teach a game. Like I remember the first time uh, like when we played Container, we played Container so often mm -hmm. that people would say like, oh, I really want to get in on like the Knights Container game. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, well, do you know how to play? And they're like, yeah, I've watched a few games. So mm -hmm. I'm, of course I know how to play. And so there was a lot of like, to, to learn a game in that house, you would just watch people who were playing it and they would teach you like in between their turns. Mm -hmm. And so over like a week, because we were college kids, we didn't have anything else to do. We played a lot of Titan. Study. Um, yeah. Um, we, oh, like, we, like, we were playing a lot of Titan, and a lot of people were learning how to play Titan. And then gradually we'd play three player games, we'd play two player, and then we weren't playing it, we were talking about Titan. Uh -huh. So the thing about Titan that's amazing, for people who don't know it, the, the short version is if you like Heroes of Might and Magic, you like Titan. It's the same like core system. If you like math. The, the, there's a there's an overworld map, and then when you get into battles, it zooms in and you play a little tactical war game. And, uh, you know, so it, Where it's, the other people sit around watching you. Yeah, they watch, they watch yeah. you play the game. And then every player has one person called it or one character called a Titan, which levels up as you kill more monsters. And if you lose your Titan, you, you lose the game and it's a player elimination game. And that is the worst way I could describe Titan, because the thing that is amazing about Titan is it's the math of Titan is incredible. Mm -hmm. It is such a beautifully constructed, mm -hmm. has a beautifully yeah, constructed absolutely. number system, mm -hmm. and so like the way like the probability works on the board, like you, you're building, you're generating these stacks of troops, and when a troop moves, it gets a muster depending on the composition of the legion and also wh where it's standing. So if you want to double your troop growth, you can split your troops in half. Right. And by splitting them in half, though, you've made one strong army into two weak armies. And so the board has these, like, it's almost like currents. Right. Where, where the board basically pulls out into the middle and then it has a clockwise ring that's kind of wavy and then it has a counterclockwise ring, or those are opposite, that is, that is a single line on the outside track. Mm -hmm. And things are constantly forcing you out to the rim of the board and it's a little harder and slower to climb to the middle. Mm -hmm. And so you can be, like, downwind or upwind of an opponent mm -hmm. and it recreates this, like, fascinating operational tension where you're like, okay, I can split my forces because I know that I'm like upwind of the enemy mm -hmm. and it's going to take them a long time to loop around back to me. And all this is powered by a single D6 movement roll where every turn you roll the movement die. And I have like a fancy casino die in there because I wanted to have a fancy big die uh, for the movement die. And then all your legions, uh, you have to move at least one legion, but then any that you move have to move that number of spaces. And there's interesting considerations. Then the other thing I'll mention about Titan's number system that is so beautiful is all at, uh, all creatures have two statistics. They have a strength and a power. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. that's It's like skill. It's power and skill. Yeah. And power is... Uh, so they're both numbers kind of like one through six or so on mm -hmm. average. And, but they're both doubly inscribed. It's Power is your hit points, mm -hmm. but also the number of dice you roll in combat. Mm -hmm. And then skill is how good you are at hitting... And if there's a differential, that moves the, the hit. So if you have a high skill versus a low skill, it's very easy to hit the low skill creature. Mm -hmm. But then skill is also your movement points on the battle board. Yep. And if you multiply those numbers together, that's the point value of the, of the creature. Yeah. So like a 212 is a, 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 a two power 12 skill. There isn't one of those, but there is a 12-2. 12 12-2, yeah. Um, that's a 24 point creature. And you could say, like, oh, a 24-point creature, I bet they could beat a lot two 12-point creatures. Mm -hmm. And generally, they, they can, with some interesting exceptions. Yeah. Um, and it handles terrain beautifully, and it just it just so rewards study. And even though it... Um, I think about the rules of the game as being, like, just fundamentally so elegant, so well-built. They're never... I never... The idea of having to refer to a fact or, like, going to BGG to look up a rule point didn't occur to me because the rules for Titan were so tight, tightly written that I, you could answer every question in the rules if you if did rules as written. And the reason why the law of root is the law of root is because Titan's rule book is the law of Titan. Which is something we, yeah, we discussed a lot. Yeah, and we then, discussed then we were like, oh, let's do this. Ah, this, this is like one of my favorite game rule books. I am so, kind of excited to play it again. I know. And I think, I actually, I don't, normally CG graphics in board games I think are goofy. I think the Valley Games publication of Titan is actually really, really good. I think that the individual character art is goofy, but like the muster diagram is great. It does a great job on this player aid. Um, oh, 
Titan, Titan's the best. That, that, that old board with the black hexes between the between the spaces. If yeah. I played it for a long time, I remember going to bed and like just seeing white like after images of those for like an hour of, of those of those black hexes. I think that I think Valley Games might have made like an iOS app. I don't think it's still supported, so it might be one of those like uh-huh. you know it was if you had an iPhone in the early 2010s, you could play Titan on. All I, all I remember is the Java version, which is. I was like, I'm really good at this game, and I played it. I'm like, I am terrible at this game. Yeah. I'm about to die. Uh, yeah, so Titan's amazing. Uh, it is, if you ever stumble onto a copy, if you're just, I mean, the thing I'd ask you about Titan is, I think it, it's, it's a fun game to study because there's a lot to learn. Yeah. There. And if you're in a place in your life where you really want, like, a war game, to really like learn and you have you have someone who wants to go into it it is yeah. such a cool two two and three player game it's very good too yeah, yeah. and then uh, the thing it's good at higher counts too but everybody really has to know the game the, the what, you know patrick mentioned earlier that when you're fighting a battle everybody else is just watching mm-hmm. or in our instance we were playing game boys and video game <laughs> you know, oh yeah 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 no we didn't have that. um yeah. sometimes we would have a second game of titan going on a on a different screen <laughs> if you just play the other game That's awesome. uh, we, we played a lot of titan um but w- when players start really learning the game you, you look at a battle and you're like okay you have this many guys you're gonna beat me so I'm gonna surrender, but you have to kill two of your. Yeah, units. And that's built into the game. Yeah, it, yeah. it's built into yeah. the game, and it, it is a like the way uh, seeding battles works is absolutely a fundamental mechanism of the game because what it does is it lets two competent players say like, okay, well we know what's gonna happen here, so like we don't need to fight this battle. And then sometimes you'll run into like a novel situation where we're mm-hmm. like, ooh, in this context, like that many lions in the bramble against that many rangers, like I don't know exactly what's gonna go happen Mm -hmm. let's actually fight it out and then that battle is actually even interesting for the other players at the table right because they might not have ever seen that combination so my two my two stories from because he talked about uh ogre taking out an angel you know which means they had to roll a lot of sixes right it's two to four uh my brother and i hacked at each other in this battle in the middle of a two-player game for a while and we got down to the point where i had an angel left with five hits on it which mm-hmm. was one hit away from dying, yep. if you remember correctly, angels are 6-4, and he had one with one damage. And we were like, well, I guess, you know, the, all we have to do now is fly them next to each other and, and take one last swing at each other. And I killed his angel, oh, and he killed my angel. So our, our legions were mutually... On, a, on, a, on something he tried to get me to seed, I, we fought it out, and we, we ended up with mutually just mutual destruction. And then later in the same game, my friend uh, Brian... Attack me in the mountains, and I had my first dragon of that game, mm-hmm. which you only get in the mountains. And I was like, I'm not giving up this dragon. Like, yeah. to hell with that. And so we played out the battle. I had an ogre and a dragon and a legion, and I didn't, I didn't certainly didn't win. There was no mathematical way I was going to win, mm-hmm. but I ended up like killing so much of his legion, it like set the pace for the rest of the game because he just he lost one of his better legions mm-hmm. fighting this stupid, oh, so fighting this stupid dragon on a hill. So. Uh, I'm so excited to play Titan right now. <laughs> I, I, We're just going to run out here and play Titan. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, Arx is delayed for at least another three years. So, uh, on BDG, there are four expansions the original designers have made. Mm-hmm. And they're just notes or, like, somebody scanned. Like, they just, they, like, made Xerox copies of them and sold them at conventions. And I've always been, like, I think if you wanted to do it again, not us, but yeah. if a company wanted to do this again, I think, like, if you want to talk about Kickstarter bait or gold like yeah. like just get all four of those expansions out there and I, I don't they may not be good sure I but, but I would buy them because I, I want to see them yeah I, it's hard <laughs> to even imagine expanding because the, the system is so so, big so yeah tight. so well built yeah. there's um <clears throat> there is a uh, oh my gosh why can't I remember his name even I've worked with him he's an illustrator that his name is uh, illustrator of bios genesis anyway there is a fan illustration, ver- illustrated version of Titan that is yeah. the same person who did the Magic Realm illustration. Oh, yeah, those, those are good. Yeah, in fact, I showed Karim, that. Karim, that's his I sh- name. I showed Karim. the Magic Realm to John Gilmore this weekend. Um, and he, he did basically, he did Titan in this a similar, like, kind of gradient mm-hmm. style. Mm-hmm. It's awesome. It's really, really beautiful and clean. And I'm like, I just, I don't know if it's the kind of game, like, even if we had access to the license that I would, well. No. There's no, so, okay, here's the difference. Here's the difference between. Leader games and whirly games. Because there'll be a point in my career in whirly where I'm like, no other company would do this weird project because it's not going to sell. Right. It will sell 5,000 copies yeah, yeah, yeah. 
maybe 10 and that's it. Yeah. That's all that we'll ever sell. It will never turn to a living product. And so it just doesn't make sense to use a company like Leader Games to produce. To produce a Titan. It's just a bad, it's like a fundamentally bad investment. Right. But I mean, there is, there is a small game company out there who wants to be a really good curator who could who could do justice yeah. by this. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about that like with, with with a game like Magic Realm. Yeah. There's like no like even if you were to modern there's no way there's no path for Magic Realm because if you modernize it you're going to alienate the same people who would get you to that five thousand copy limit mm -hmm. and you if you make you're gonna have a really hard time making it compete with other more modern open world games. Yeah. And so that means if you if you modernize it you're not going to get to five thousand. If you keep it old you're only ever going to get to five thousand. Yeah. And so you're, there's just no path. Uh, for it to really so the in. so the real way to redo Magic Realm is for Cole to order me to go work on Path. Yeah, I mean, make a new open world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. So yeah, there, there are some words about Titan. I think we're probably way over time. Um, uh, yeah, but we yeah. love Titan. So. We love Titan. <laughs> Patrick has two Titan shirts. I have two Titan shirts. I have two copies of Titan. I have this one, and I have the eighties Avalon Hill. Yeah, and the Avalon Hill one is amazing. Awesome. It's it, it has amazing art. It's Every so piece cool. is custom art. There yeah, are, so all the ogres have different like positions and postures. There are thirty cyclopses in, in in a punch board when you get the game, and they all he drew thirty cyclopses. He didn't. And he it, didn't say here's ten. Well, and it matters because Titan has my favorite component limit of like any game, which is that when a monster dies, you put it back in the you you put it in the box lid or whatever. He's gone. He's they're gone. And so in the the late game of Titan, which That's... happens. You are out of monsters. Yeah. And like the low, like you can no longer build stacks and the game just like runs out of pieces. It's really cool. That's my, I think. I, I usually end it before then, but. Yeah. One, one small, my only adjustment I ever want in the, in the world of Titan is I love, I've played Titan with six players a bunch and that piece limit matters. Uh huh. And it just doesn't matter in the earlier, the lower. Oh, so you can cut down. And so like yeah. it need it just needs to scale. And I think it was one of those things that because that kind of player scaling wasn't common yet. Yeah. They, they just wouldn't have even known that they could have I mean, put a little played, symbol in the Everyone place. played four to six player, and they, yeah. they took them all day, and they didn't care. And they didn't care. I mean, I always think about, um, someone once told me that, like, when the old civilization came out, the Tresham civilization in the 80s, mm -hmm. that was the short game. Mm -hmm. You would like, oh, well, you know, do you want to play a long war game, or do you want to play, like, a four-hour Civ game? And I was like, oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll play the four-hour Civ game. Um, awesome. Cool. All right, well, uh, that's it for Titan Chat. Uh, next week we'll we'll de debate. You want to uh, talk about lifestyle? We'll, we'll debate brambles versus uh, deserts, recruit paths, lifestyle. How do you feel about the fact that Root is a lifestyle game for so many people? I'm I sorry, you're trying to wrap up, and I'm like, ah! no, 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 no. Th that's a super good question. Yeah. Um, okay, this is one of those I wish we could have like confession booths. I can leave, and you can answer. And then I mean, because I, I know what I would say. How do you feel about it? Well, we've we've talked about. I mean, we've talked about hiring an editor. Yeah, to yeah. just do root stuff. Just do root stuff because I think it's got that much legs, and um, we love. I would love to have someone I can just submit content to, like when with Josh and the Badgers, and be like, okay, there. This is my cool thing, and like to Peace. just really do like you know the high level career direction. Like, hey, yeah. next root expansion, we want like. Uh, swamps. Theme, yeah. The theme is swamps and like stickiness. Yeah. And like, in the, you, you, you know, we have a developer designer that we trust that we'll, it's working. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah. So um, I. That's how I feel about it right now. I, I got some CEOs so I can just make that happen. But you, you could, but <laughs> also like I, they're outstanding questions. Why? I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, think. <laughs> I think um, root. Uh, when you're designing, I feel like you're always, at least for me, I'm always designing for myself from a different period in my life. Mm -hmm. So like, root is a game I would have loved in high school I would have played the hell out of her it would have been all that I would have played mm -hmm. um, and you know different games are designed for me you know designed for, for different groups in the past that like don't they don't really exist anymore mm -hmm. I um, I like lifestyle games I like a game that really rewards re re uh, re repeated plays I think they're I think they're really special and interesting. It's like how, like, my favorite games are the games that I drill in. Like, I have probably played 60 games of Quacks, and I love Quacks. I'm happy to play more Quacks. Um, there are 18xx games that I'm, like, north of 50 plays in. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think I could work in this industry if I didn't like playing the same game a lot of times. You know, and, like, Titan, I, I have no idea. I don't even know how to begin numbering the games of Titan. That'd be weird, yeah. Um, because it's just, it got played so commonly. So, 
having a game which gets played that much, it, I think, is is a, is, a, is a good thing. I think sometimes in the hobby, people talk about the hobby in ways that are, um, that map a path, right? So there are some designers and publishers and players who like being very like up to date on all the new games that are coming out and kind of moving through the hobby. And so when they see a game like Root, it can seem selfish, mm -hmm. right? Because they can be like, oh, well, your game was only thriving because you're not letting that population go out to the other games. Right. And I, I think that like, what, what's happening there is they're making a category error, which like, no, there are a lot of people in this industry who like, they just kind of want to find the game that's right for them. Yeah. And then play it over and over and over again. And right. that's g fine. It's m much more environmentally friendly. Say, I mean, I miss that way to play. I mean, I played on you know, I've played hundreds of cosmic encounter games, so yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, and to answer, like, someone asked about Oath Expansion, I think that's how we'd have to do it too, but we'll, yeah, we'll talk about it now. Yeah, that, that, that's how that we can. I'm ready to design a fan faction though for Root. I have a like some of the byproduct of Dungeon Fortress. Fortress is starting, is starting, yeah, starting to call us. So whenever you say, go ahead and make a fan fiction, yeah, I'm going to post one. When we're, when we're, when we're ready to, to, go, to go back to Rootland. Yeah, I think, I mean, in general, though, like, I think in terms of our own playing habits, I feel like you and I both sample a lot of the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. As an office, we try to be, like, somewhat current. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to our own playing habits, we are sticks in the mud. And we kind of play the games that we like. And play Kingdom Rush. I mean, I'm... I'm probably like 2,000 hours into Dota by now, and maybe maybe 1,000 into Apex, and like I'm not done with either of those games. There are a lot of characters I don't know how to play yet. Um, yeah, I ran into somebody who's played um, thousands of hours of PUBG. I, so the streamer I went and watched, and I, was yeah. like, I was like, oh my god. Uh -uh. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I, think, I, I think that, uh, I think lifestyle games are great. I think it, you know if, if someone wants to there is no there is like no nicer thing that someone could say to I think either of us than like hey I play your game like a lot like I, I've really spent time like thinking about it and playing it like that that to me warms my heart more than like a sales figure. I spent a lot of time playing it too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Well, that thus concludes our chat. Um, we will be back in March for the March chat, which will be, you know, first Tuesday of March, probably. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you hungry for dates and announcements, uh, maybe we'll have a date by March that we'll announce, but it could be... For ARCs? For ARCs. I'm yeah. not sure. We're still figuring it out, and we have some production things that need sorted out before we can really lock it in. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is, by the time we show you guys this game, I want, I just want it to be really good, and it to be, you know, like, ready for for the attention. So I've been, I'm trying to take my time and not, not rush it. So that, that, that's the main, main thing. I'm trying to get them the time. Yeah. And I appreciate that. It's yeah. just so like, I don't know. It, uh, I think, um, you, it, there's a funny balance because sometimes that, that, uh, the urgency and the urgency of a deadline does wonders, mm -hmm. but there are other times when you're building things that need to be a little bit more open-ended and like ARCs. Yeah. And ARCs has really benefited. And actually, Oath really benefited that. I mean, Oath had this crazy, like, pre-year where it was, like, not even a game. It was just an idea. <laughs> and that that long gestation really, really helped. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have more things to talk about, though, for sure. All right, let's play Magic Round before March. Tuesday. Okay, we'll play March. We'll figure out how to play it. Let's play Titan. Last last Titan note. We really like, need like a coach to come in and teach us a magic realm. Oh yeah. my god! I've, I've I've like learned it on three separate occasions, and each time I've been like, I know how to play this game, but I need to completely relearn. Sure, Whereas to Titan's credit, I feel like I could play Titan right now. In fact, I um, I yes, absolutely. Which is crazy. I mean, like the, no, the fact no doubt that we know it. so many of these specific monster stats, despite not having played a game of Titan in years. Sometimes I just think about them. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just think about them. So I uh, so we talk about Titan a lot in the studio. And when I took Nick to BGGCon a couple years ago before COVID, uh, I was, they, had, they had Titan in the library. And I was like, Nick, let me teach you how to play Titan. We don't have to play Titan. Let me just teach just you teach it you. so that you understand what it is. And I, it was so, I felt wonderful that I could just teach the game blind. I had not, at that point, I had not played Titan in probably four years. I, yeah, I and really I just, have no doubt. Oh, I have no doubt. It is yeah. so natural. You it, can only yeah. rain strike on even turns. Yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. You start with eight pieces. You have to break the legion first turn. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, and and when you roll the die, 
You have to move one legion. You have to move one that legion. You can't, Which you can't one sit, be? sit around. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, that's it for Titan Shit. All right, take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. It was lovely seeing you all. And stay tuned for um, lots of news. We'll probably have Marauder shipping news next month. Yeah. And then we can we can talk about that. All right, anyway, take care, everybody. Fun! <laughs>